Great, thank you for joining us all this afternoon. This webinar today is a follow-up to the recent question and answer session, which was published earlier this month, addressing exercise during these times of uncertainty and COVID-19. The paper was endorsed by the section of Sports Cardiology and Exercise of the European Association of Preventative Cardiology. It was fantastic that the first author was Dr. Batia, one of CRI's research fellows with Professor Sanjay Sharma and Dr. Michael Papadakis as the senior authors. We're delighted to have Sanjay and Michael here today, as well as Professor Matt Wilson, the head of sports and exercise medicine at the Institute for Sports, Exercise and Health. They're here to discuss this paper and any questions that you have. Here's a quick overview of the day, uh, the, the, the afternoon, with uh, first talk by Professor Sharma, followed by Matt Wilson, Dr. Michael Papadakis, before Sanjay concludes with some comments. After this, there'll be a question and answer session. So please submit any questions you have on the chat, and we'll answer as many as possible of these questions during the final session. I'm now going to pass over to Professor Sanjay Sharma for the first talk. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Steve. I'll be speaking to you about exercise in the COVID-19 era, facts and fiction, and I will focus my talk primarily on the cardiovascular system. The objectives of my talk are as follows. I'm going to describe the effects of COVID-19 infection on the heart. I'll then discuss the effects of exercise on susceptibility to infection. I'll go on to describe the effects and consequences of myocarditis in athletes. I will then highlight the challenges of diagnosing myocarditis in asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic athletes who may have had COVID-19 infection. I will then provide a rationale for who should be investigated with respect to their cardiovascular system and finish by delivering advice for individuals training for future endurance events. COVID-19, as you all know, is caused by SARS coronavirus type 2, which is highly infectious and has infected almost 8 million people worldwide and killed almost 440,000 people. So it's highly infectious. In the vast majority, it causes a relatively mild illness, but it can cause debilitating symptoms in 15%, result in a critical illness requiring advanced life support in 4%, and cause death in around 2%. The overall mortality is much higher in those who are old, obese, have high blood pressure, diabetes, or cardiovascular and respiratory comorbidities. Now, we'll be talking about young athletes mainly, but it's important to rec recognize that there are many people out there that jog and cycle on a daily basis who have some of these comorbidities, such as obesity, hypertension, and diabetes. And around 40% of those people who engage in mass endurance events are usually in their fifth and sixth decade. As far as the cardiovascular system goes, there are concerns that COVID-19 does affect the heart. And this is based on several studies showing elevated concentrations of serum cardiotroponin in individuals who are hospitalized. Approximately 25 to 30% of people admitted to hospital have raised troponin, and people with raised troponin often have a higher risk of adverse events, are more likely to uh, undergo mechanical ventilation, and die. We don't quite know the precise mechanism for raised troponin in uh, COVID-19 infection because we have not been able to do the precise investigations such as coronary angiography, cardiovascular magnetic resonance imaging scan, and endomyocardial biopsy in all these hospitalized individuals. But there is definitely a correlation between the severity of illness, high troponin, fever, and raised inflammatory markers, suggesting that the high troponin in the vast majority of patients represents a systemic response to inflammation. Of course, there's the possibility that uh, the virus itself may infect myocardial cells and cause inflammation. The stresses of the illness may result in a stress-related cardiomyopathy. Hypoxemia due to respiratory involvement may cause demand hypoxemia and myocyte necrosis. 
Ongoing ischemia causes pulmonary hypertension, which puts a, a massive load on the right ventricle and can cause right ventricular ischemia, resulting in troponin leak. Thromboembolic um, disease in the lungs can also cause similar problems. Some of you listening today will have underlying cardiovascular conditions, particularly the young. And in this particular situation, of course, if you've got something like long QT syndrome, and you're admitted to hospital and end up being a research patient for several drug therapies, it's important to recognize that some of these drug therapies can prolong the QT interval and cause fatal rhythm disturbances. Some people may have Brugada, and it's well recognized that very high fevers associated with any viral illness can precipitate fatal rhythm disturbances. But of course, the main concern in relation to exercise is myocarditis. We know that people who develop myocarditis can make the illness much worse if they continue to exercise and can accelerate the development of arrhythmias, sudden cardiac death, and even heart failure. But before we start getting too worried about it, I'd like to talk about the benefits of exercise and some of the advantages that exercising people actually have, particularly as sport is about to return and the ready availability of nucleic acid tests and serology means that we will identify several healthy people who had very mild or no symptoms, which may cause anxiety about the possibility of myocarditis. But exercise has numerous benefits. It reduces obesity, means that you're less likely to be diabetic if you exercise. You're protecting yourself before you start. But exercise also causes a release of myokines from the cells of the skeletal muscle, which actually help in reducing inflammation in the body. If we look at exercise and immunity, we know that people who exercise moderately for up to 60 minutes for three to four times per week, they actually have a stronger immune system. They do this by increasing the number of neutrophils and other white cells that fight infection and also increasing chemicals in the body that actually attenuate inflammation. So people who exercise regularly have a better humoral response. Apart from boosting the immune system, moderate exercise prior to a viral infection is associated with better outcomes. Indeed, during the 1998 Hong Kong flu, people who were active were much more likely to survive than sedentary people. And we know from flu epidemics that people who basically exercise are more likely to develop a more positive and pronounced immune response to flu virus. And I suspect that may also be true for COVID-19. So here is the relationship between exercise, immunity and infection. And you will see that people who exercise moderately for about 60 minutes reduce their risk of an upper respiratory tract infection by around 40 to 50 percent. Now clearly, I'm not, I'm not talking necessarily about elite athletes, but some of you have been at home either being furloughed or being forced to work from home. And some of you are probably doing much, much more exercise than you were doing during work. Now, if you are performing much, much unaccustomed exercise, this could cause metabolic, physiologic, and physiological stresses to the body. And these stresses increase the concentration of hormones like cortisol and adrenaline, which can cause immunosuppression. So we know certainly in individuals that are not necessarily highly trained, that if they push themselves beyond their limit, they can increase the risk of infection by two to six fold. This rarely applies to elite athletes unless they are doing something over and beyond their usual type of training. So clearly, if you are exercising very intensively, then there is a possibility that some people may be prone to immunosuppression. And if an individual is immunosuppressed, they can develop a viral infection, including COVID-19. And we know from mouse experiments that if viruses affect the myocardium and people continue to exercise intensively, then within the heart, there is an intense inflammatory response, a protracted um, course of inflammation, which causes enhanced necrosis within the myocardium, resulting in extensive scarring and a predisposition to sudden cardiac death. So clearly, 
exercise has important consequences in athletes. Firstly, it's a recognized cause of sudden cardiac death. It's implicated in 5 to 15 percent of all sudden cardiac deaths in young people. It's also accounted for 20 percent of all sudden deaths in the military who are usually pretty active. And therefore, when we diagnose myocarditis, the aim is to rest the heart as quickly as possible in the early stages of the disease. So we normally ask people to stop exercising completely for between three to six months. Some people who develop myocarditis never recover their, their heart function back to normal. And some of these people would normally be advised not to continue exercising uh, intensively in the future. Myocarditis can also leave scar tissue within the heart and athletes left with scar tissue need to be under life, uh, lifelong surveillance because scar can cause rhythm disturbances. So there is a massive incentive to diagnose people who've got myocarditis. And here is a list of methods of how myocarditis can be diagnosed based on clinical features, markers of, bio, 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 markers of uh, cardiac damage, viral serology, anomalies on the ECG, reduced function on the echocardiogram, but the gold standard tests are endomyocardial biopsy and cardiovascular magnetic resonance imaging scan, which we don't normally perform in everyone. We certainly don't perform biopsy in any, everyone. And it would be very difficult to place every single individual with suspected, uh, with, with, with possible COVID into an MRI scan just to prove whether or not they had subclinical myocarditis. So we've got to be very pragmatic with how we uh, approach things. So the one thing that we've got to remember is that there is no data on the prevalence of COVID-19 related myocarditis in non-hospitalized individuals. We just don't know how many of you that developed COVID-19 infection who stayed at home uh, developed myocarditis. I suspect that number is very, very small. Now we hear about the number of deaths that COVID-19 is causing every day, but I'd like to just bring this back home. The number of deaths in the young in the UK is exceptionally rare. In fact, the number of deaths in individuals aged between 0 and 19 is only 0.1%. And the number of deaths in individuals, individuals aged under 40 years old is only 1%. So this is mainly a disease that kills older people and people with cardiovascular or respiratory morbidities rather than young, healthy individuals that exercise on a regular basis. We talk about the possibility of using troponin leaks from the heart to diagnose people who may be affected. But there are problems with using troponin because the troponin is only elevated when you've got active myocarditis. So if we start testing people who end up having serological tests that are positive for COVID-19 and doing troponins on them, the absence of a raised troponin doesn't mean they didn't have subclinical myocarditis. The second worry I have about troponin measurements is that exercise itself causes an elevated troponin. So if we're going to measure troponins in athletes, they need to be rested for about two days. The third thing that we don't know about are the 99th percentile values in athletes. We know that the 99th percentile values for an elevated troponin um, that have been sort of designated by manufacturers are superseded by many individuals in the community. And I suspect athletes have even higher troponin levels than the 99th percentile values in the normal community. So we have to be cautious about who we measure troponins on. Troponin should be measured in athletes who actually have active symptoms of COVID-19, but not otherwise. We know that myocarditis can cause abnormalities on an ECG that affect the ST segment and T waves, but one has to be aware that these are common anomalies that occur as a response to physical training in normal healthy athletes. We also know that myocarditis can suppress cardiac function and cause reduced left ventricular ejection fraction, but it's recognized that long distance runners and cyclists through virtue of having an extremely large and fit heart don't have to contract their hearts very hard at rest to pump five liters of blood around the body. So several of these would have a lazy looking heart on a baseline echocardiogram. 
Exercise stress tests have been touted in various algorithms, but many of you that work in the National Health Service will agree with me that these are aerosol generating procedures and until now, certainly, and up to now, uh, are really not possible in the NHS and are only performed in very selected private organizations. We cannot perform MRIs uh, in every single individual that may have had COVID infection. The NHS is already backlogged. This is a 40 to 59, 40 minute, this is a 40 to 50 minute procedure involves cleansing and a 20 minute fallow after each procedure. So we've got to be very careful about who we should be testing. And here is my view, the sort of people that should have cardiac assessment in the context of COVID-19 infection are those people that have, have experienced chest pain, breathlessness that is disproportionate to the amount of exercise they're performing, palpitation, exertional dizziness or blackouts. These are true red flags. Anyone that's had a debilitating illness which caused them to be bedridden for more than seven days or attend a hospital or even be admitted and anyone who had a raised troponin within three to five days of illness would be someone that we would definitely want to investigate. There will be some athletes who developed a very mild illness, didn't get tested for COVID at the time and returned to play and whilst training they are unable to achieve fitness, have inappropriately elevated heart rate response during exercise or do not recover easily. This is the other group of individuals that I would be interested in investigating. You will note that the decisions relating to further assessment, in my mind, should not be governed by nucleic acid tests and serology unless they are being conducted for research. So clearly, performing serological tests is extremely useful to know whether, whether someone's had infection. Doing nucleic acid tests is useful to know whether someone may have active infection. But in asymptomatic individuals, these tests should not necessarily be a trigger for cardiac investigations in the general population, although elite sporting organizations such as the Premier League, the English Institute of Sport may have other ideas because these athletes push themselves beyond their limit for club and country. And as employers, they may feel they need to protect them um, uh, by going one mile extra. So what about advice for those of you that were planning to engage in mass endurance events, do cycle and run regularly just to maintain well-being? Well, in all of you, provided you're asymptomatic, I would maintain social distancing and good hand hygiene as stipulated by the government. Ensure that you get adequate sleep, nutrition, hydration and relaxation strategies to protect your immune system. There is certainly evidence that vitamin D and zinc supplements also promote uh, humoral immunity. If you are increasing your exercise loads because you're hopeful that something like the London Marathon will go ahead in October, then I would use small inc in increments when changing your training loads, typically less than 10% per week. I would monitor yourself for early symptoms and signs of overtraining and illness. And clearly, if you're feeling run down and under the weather, I would actually stop exercising for about seven days before resuming again. Avoid intensive, train and intensive training if you're ill or are experiencing the early signs and symptoms of an illness. Clearly, we've got more ready availability of nucleic acid tests and serology, and you may be in a much better position now than you were two weeks ago uh, to find out whether you're actually infected or not. And with that in mind, I'd like to uh, pass over to uh, the next speaker, but I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Gatti for her help with a couple of the uh, cartoon slides, and I'm very grateful to her. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sanjay. That's a brilliant talk. Just to reassure you, there is a plan to have the, uh, the, the presentation uh, available live after, after, after this is um, completed, <clears throat> hopefully by Wednesday. Also, um, if there are any questions, please try and be specific with the questions because it might be difficult to um, track when that question was asked at the point of the presentation. So as much information as possible for any questions which, are, um, which you're, you're asking. Now, on... Um, I'd like to now invite our next speaker, Professor Matt Wilson, um, to give the second talk that we have today.
Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Sanjay, and thank you to Cardiac Risk and the Young for inviting me today. Uh, Sanjay has touched on a couple of points from the endurance perspective, um, and today I was just hoping to highlight some factors and some considerations that you may want to consider for those athletes that you work with, or if you're an athlete yourself, about how to get back on track post-quarantine. I have no conflicts of interest uh, and our learning objectives are just to put some contextual factors behind this and to try and put some ideas into your mind just to ensure that we are potentially reducing the injury and illness burden. So for those of you working with athletes, I'm sure that for the elite proportion, you're well aware of this document from the, uh, the DCMS on supporting the elite athletes return to competition both from a uh, sporting clubs and federations perspective, but also from a venue perspective. Uh, and I think there are some important lessons uh, for those of us working with community athletes, myself as, a, as an adolescent rugby coach, but how we can support the lower tiers of sport return to play. So this is a good document that I would say uh, that point you towards to help support some of those decisions. But I think this is an excellent document from Keith Stokes's group. Um, which is for us to put an effective return to play strategy in place, we really do need to understand the type of athlete that we are working with. And that may be athletes who have developed illness and injury during the, the, the quarantine period, those athletes that have a illness and injury leading up to the quarantine period who may not have been able to access adequate medical provision. Part of the group that Sanjay just spoke about are unfortunately a proportion of athletes who have developed COVID infection. And it's very, very clear from the number of emails and phone calls that I am receiving about how do we actually support the psychological well-being of athletes as they return to, to play. Myself as a parent, I've seen my own child go through a significant growth spurt during the last couple of months. And so that's another challenging population about a, a unique factor that we don't traditionally associate with returning to competition is the growth and maturation status of our athletes. And there will be a significant proportion of people who were severely injured prior to lockdown. And how do we actually support those athletes return to competition? Now, before lockdown happened, probably most of us, amateur or elite, were in some form of uh, training, whether that's the general preparation phase whether that's your training for the Olympiad and you're in your peak phase leading up to next month or whether in your recovery phase. But essentially the complexities about how we guide return to play invariably mean where do we want to get to? What is our goal? What is our ambition? For the Premier League, that's very clear. That's 92 matches in the next six to eight weeks. But for recreational athletes, today the Great North Run, for example, was canceled. How do we actually support those decisions? And I think the primary concern is how do we reduce the increased risk associated with a sport specific layoff? We know that skeletal muscle uh, is particularly susceptible to disuse and tendons don't also like this, uh, particularly from a tendon stiffness model in a relatively short period of time. And we can learn lessons uh, and there's a, there's a great study which has been discussed quite a lot over recent months and that is the NFL lockdown. So due to some various contractual disputes, there was a period of time in 2011 where NFL players were actually barred from any kind of S&C, coaching, medical care for about a 14 week period, not too dissimilar, or maybe just a bit longer than what we're facing at the moment. Preseason was very short. However, when preseason, when season did start, there were 12 Achilles tendon ruptures in the five weeks following lockdown. Traditionally, tendon ruptures would be in the range of about four to eight. Me, personally, our facility, we've been dealing with a couple of tendon ruptures in football players who've returned to play in the last two weeks. So we do know that this is going to be an issue. And for those of you that are following and keeping an eye on the Bundesliga, we've seen that an increased rate of injury in, in that cohort. So it is something that we are acutely aware of. This is uh, the Liverpool fixture list for July. And we can see that actually congested fixtures are also an issue. So most of these matches are circa three days, three to four days between matches. So we know that not only have we got a short window to allow athletes to retrain, regain their technical skills, fitness, abilities, et cetera, but actually we're put, imposing a congested block of fixtures. So essentially uh, uh, squad rotation and maximizing recovery strategies is gonna be key. 
But it's not all bad news for those sports that have had the ability where we know that the competition schedule isn't going to be started anytime soon. Data from Jan Ekstrand's group with the, uh, the UEFA study has shown that if you can do every 10 additional pre-season training sessions, you reduce your injury burden and you increase your squad availability for the following season. So perhaps this is a golden opportunity for those individuals to try and get a, a decent block of training and to help try and reduce and make people a little bit more robust when training competition does restart. Specificity has ruined lockdown, for example. I do know when you talk to some uh, squads of uh, conditioning staff who work with power-based uh, sprint uh, uh, athletes that they're particularly concerned that for those that have been doing cardiovascular exercise on a bicycle, we know that a lot of uh, hamstring fascicle length is reduced by cycling, but what have people been doing during lockdown is been doing more cycling, more, more general conditioning running. So cutting, turning, landing off jumps, heading the ball, tackling technique, giving your head in the wrong position, correct rucking technique, all of these things that haven't, people haven't been able to do, uh, we just need to be a little bit more aware of. We do know that sprinting is a great way of uh, protecting from injury, so regular exposure to maximal velocity appears to protect, but we also know that sudden increases in high uh, running speed are particularly known to increase the risk of a hamstring injury. So it's the holy grail. How do we get a training program that optimizes performance and decreases the risk of injury? Can they go hand in hand? They can, but we just need a sensible approach to that. And I think something that has been, when I follow Twitter, uh, I'm not an avid Twitter person, but I do follow it and keep an eye out to it. And I do think the psychological readiness hasn't been particularly well addressed in the sports medicine community. And I would point individuals to this document, which I think is excellent from the English Institute of Sport, looking at the psychological readiness uh, and the different phases about where people are. I know uh, from working with uh, the athletes that I work with that there's a, there's, not only is there a fear and apprehension about returning to sport due to the ongoing pandemic, but actually how to physically uh, return, how to uh, uh, redefine the goals and aspirations, the targets that individuals need to ascertain their performance goals. Some other things that people may not be aware of, but I'd just like to highlight uh, is training services. Um, a lot of people haven't been able to put their football boots on or their, or, or their rugby boots, but we do know that rotational traction uh, can increase the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the contact between the studs and the, the pitch uh, and increase the chance of a knee injury, an ankle injury. Uh, we've been, uh, although this is one boot manufacturer, we've been following this up in, uh, uh, with Athel Thompson in Qatar for a number of years now, looking at AstroTurf uh, boots, firm ground boots, and soft ground outsole boots. And we know that actually, as we follow throughout the season of different grass types, whether that's wet, warm season grass or cool season grass, uh, we don't know there's different rotational tractional forces. So perhaps now the grounds are getting a little bit harder. It probably isn't wise to put on a long studded uh, soft ground boot as you return to training in the first instance. Uh, immunity, Sanjay just touched on this, uh, and I will say, let's not forget the basics. Upper respiratory tract infections are a common cause of, uh, of mistraining and competition. And if you look at Lars Engelbertson's papers in the Olympics and the World Championships and FIFA, we know that it accounts between half and 75% of all the illnesses involved in upper respiratory tract infections. Uh, and Neil Walsh's work is excellent in identifying. Uh, oh, excuse me, it's a fire <laughs> background. Uh, how can we uh, support um, modifying? Uh, 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 how can we support uh, immunity in athletes? The basics: optimize your sleep, avoiding mid-afternoon caffeine, minimizing and uh, ma uh, managing your stress, a well-balanced diet, uh, and for those athletes who have continued to train very hard during the COVID period, avoiding chronic low energy availability. We'll talk about vitamin D, ignore the fire alarm in the background, please, it's a test. Uh, there doesn't appear to be any evidence for vitamin D treatment for the prevention of COVID, um, but as Sanjay says, uh, a bit of treatment there. My trailer thought of bar, sorry for this. Uh, for the um, vitamin D for uh, acute respiratory infections. 
And finally, just before we get to the, uh, the final slide, it is getting warm outside. And so whilst I've seen some individuals over the weekend with burnt shoulders, um, uh, let's again, let's not forget the basics. We don't want uh, individuals going down with heat stroke and hyponatremia. So the best way to do that is prevention. We, two examples of this, um, this is a triathlon that was in December in Australia. And you can see uh, in December, 2006, the race day was 28 degrees. Uh, and the two days prior, it was 17 and 18 degrees, so 10 degrees lower. And there was a 15 uh, individuals with heat-related illness. Um, but in February, for the same triathlon, same race day temperature, but the preceding days were nice and warm. So heat, individuals were heat acclimated. So as individuals are returning to competition and the weather is nice outside, let's ensure that individuals are well hydrated and used to the heat before generating high body temperatures. So to go back to Keith Stokes' slide, this is my final slide. If you are an individual who wishes to return to play uh, with or without COVID, you're in this phase where probably you're likely to be under a physician's review. I would follow Sanjay's path and you have your high risk features, uh, which would require individuals to seek a cardiologist or a respiratory physician's review. And if you are then allowed to initiate a graduated return to play, I would implement a 24 to 48 hours stop and assess policy, where it's circular in motion. Those individuals uh, who respond well to a graduated return to play can continue. Those that aren't doing so well, actually that's an opportunity just to look at identifying features about why that individual is not responding. Whether it's nutrition, whether it's immune, whether it's sleep and recovery, or whether it's a musculoskeletal injury. Uh, and it would be circular in motion for me. Thank you very much and apologize for the fire alarm. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, brilliant talk. We'll now move on to our, our third and final presentation from Dr. Michael Papadakis. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, and over the next uh, 10 minutes, what we'll try and uh, cover is give you an understanding and hopefully also provide some critical appraisal of the recommendations for cardiac evaluation prior to return to sports in the era of COVID-19, who should be evaluated and how. Now, obviously, whether we do a cardiac evaluation or not will depend on two things. The first thing is, is it necessary? And the second thing, if it's necessary, is it feasible? And both those questions have partly been answered by Professor Sharma's talk already. So what you've heard already is that we know that uh, COVID-19 can impact on the heart on multiple ways. Uh, the dreaded outcome is uh, myocardial necrosis, inflammation and myocarditis. And we also know that up to 30% of those admitted to hospital may have an elevated troponin and troponin is the cardiac enzyme we predominantly use to diagnose myocardial injury. So there seems to have a significant impact in the heart and as such that, that seems to justify at least uh, in some individuals uh, screening or cardiac evaluation prior to return to exercise. Now, if it's necessary, then we need to address whether it's feasible. And for that to be feasible, we need to have the right test to detect the condition we're looking for. And in this particular case, myocarditis, and we've heard already that yes, the tests have some limitations, but uh, most of our tests uh, are able to detect myocarditis in one way or another. Once we identify someone as well, we need to be able to manage them and there are protocols not only for treating myocarditis but also treating athletes with myocarditis. And then we need to answer the question as whether test is uh, safe during the pandemic and I think the honest truth is that probably not in the beginning but it becomes safer and safer as we get used to the new situation. Are there enough resources in terms of testing facilities 
but also the expertise to interpret those investigations. And then there will be a cost involved, obviously. And as you can realize from all those tests, it, it's not going to be an all or nothing answer. It's not going to apply in the same way for every country or every sporting organization. Now, before I go to the actual protocols, I also wanted to come back to the question that uh, Professor Sharma mentioned, whether it's necessary to test all athletes to diagnose or to see whether they're immune to COVID-19. Now, just to remind everyone that we've got essentially two types of tests. One is a nucleic acid test that we try to detect uh, the viral acute infection through a throat or nose swab. The other one is an antibody test and we've got IgM antibodies that are usually produced quite quickly by our uh, body and they're taken to mean acute infection and we also have IgG antibodies which are produced one to three weeks after the onset of symptoms and we usually interpret them as meaning past exposure. It's also important to highlight that specifically for SARS-CoV-2, although there is an assumption that we get some immunity as proven by the IgG antibodies, that's not proven. So uh, IgG antibodies do not equate immunity and therefore all necessary precautions should still continue. Now, the answer to the question is that we don't necessarily need to do COVID-19 testing, although it can be very useful. And whether we do it or not will largely depend on the availability and reliability of testing and that's increasing in most settings and countries. It may be specific to the circumstances. For example, it's completely different to consider an amateur athlete who wants to go back to his regular cycling compared to a football team that wants to go back to retraining and competitive games. And at that point, uh, the nucleic acid test may be also useful to detect asymptomatic carriers who still have the ability to infect other individuals. And we also need to remember that prevention of infection is not just about the players themselves, but also the supporting staff, whether that's physio, medics, cooks and anyone else who's supporting them during their training. Now, this is the first protocol that was published by the Italian Federation of Sports Medicine. And I'll just briefly run you through it. So at the top, it starts with, uh, you can see that it's very test heavy for COVID-19, despite the fact that I just told you that it may not be absolutely necessary. So what our Italian colleagues suggest is that you do your throat or nose swab, and if that's the negative, then you proceed to antibody testing. Now, if you follow the middle column that says IgG negative, IgM negative, which means someone who has never been exposed to the virus, as both tests are negative, then they still suggest investigations as per group two at the bottom of the slide. So essentially what our Italian colleagues are saying is that all athletic individuals who undergo comprehensive cardiac evaluation irrespective of whether they have ever been exposed to the virus or not. And obviously a lot of you will be wondering whether that's feasible even for the most well-off uh, sporting organizations. Now, for group one that you see there, which includes athletes who either have evidence of past exposure, you'll see that they not only they suggest history, physical examination, ECG, echo, exercise test and blood test, but they go further to include holter monitoring as well as uh, further investigations for potential lung pathology. Now, this is the second protocol that has been suggested, and this comes from experts from the American College of Cardiology. And because this slide looks quite busy, I've tried to simplify it for you. So, again, what our American colleagues are saying, similar to the Italian colleagues, is that you have to start with a swap. So you have to test whether someone has an acute infection. And if the swap negative and asymptomatic, then no limitation and no further investigations. If the swab positive and asymptomatic, the suggestion is that they should uh, stay off exercise for two weeks uh, in, in order for them to have the time theoretically to become negative, but no need for cardiac investigations. 
But if they become symptomatic, irrespective whether they've got mild or severe symptoms, everybody should be testing. And the minimum testing that they're suggesting is a troponin, a 12-lead ECG, and a transthoracic echocardiogram. So this is a, a bit of a more conservative approach in that they don't say that all athletes should be testing, but still athletes who have symptoms should be tested irrespective of the severity of the disease. Now, the protocol that uh, uh, also uh, the, this webinar originated from, which is our proposal for cardiac evaluation of elite athletes prior to return to competitions, is a protocol that aimed to be very widely applicable, and that's why we didn't just reach a consensus within our group, but we liaise with international experts around Europe and uh, even further. Now, we try to take a pragmatic approach, and on that pragmatic approach, we had to, to balance uh, the scientific evidence that suggests that there may be an impact of COVID-19 on the heart. But remember what we have already said, that they likely to have a significant impact on the heart will be in the most severely affected cases, not every athlete and not every athlete who developed some symptoms. And then we had to balance that with the feasibility and potential limitations of actually being able to do tests for COVID-19, as well as limitations and availability of cardiac testing, as well as expertise. So I'll go you through our protocol uh, step by step. There are three legs to the protocol, and this is for elite athletes, where we say that they should in any case, have a clinical history and examination by the team physician, since a lot of them either have not been exercising on a regular basis or they've been exercising uh, at a lesser degree. And Matt Wilson highlighted the importance of that uh, already. And for the individuals who either never had uh, symptoms or they had mild infection, but they have been asymptomatic for at least seven days, then we suggest that they can go gradually back to retraining and return to play. Okay, so those individuals with mild disease do not require further investigations. And you may ask, how do you uh, quantify mild disease? And for the purposes of this particular protocol, it's individuals who did not end up in the hospital because of COVID-19. Those who had a short illness defined as less than seven days. Those with no debilitating symptoms, so they were not better eaten because of the disease. And those who didn't have symptoms convincing of uh, acute myocarditis. And the predominant symptom will be chest pain and additional symptoms can include shortness of breath, palpitations and syncope. Now, the middle group is comprised by uh, individuals uh, who, sorry for moving forward, by individuals who are currently asymptomatic, but they essentially uh, uh, had prolonged illness, and we define that as lasting more than seven days, or had myocardial symptoms during uh, acute infection that was highly suggestive of myocarditis. Now, for those individuals, we suggest to start with a 12-lead ECG and transthoracic echocardiogram. And if there is a concern, then they can go to further investigations. But if that's normal, the proposal was to perform an exercise tolerance testing, recognizing, however, in retrospect, that the exercise testing has been challenging. But there are ways around it, and the reality is that there are a lot of places that exercise testing with the right personal protective equipment has started happening. And in individual cases, you may also consider, if you consider the risk to be low, to do a form of exercise testing that they can do a training session with an ECG monitor on. Now, we've left the comprehensive evaluation, which includes ECG echocardiogram, troponin levels, and cardiac MRI for the most severely affected individuals. So those will be individuals who had debilitating symptoms, warranting bed rest for a number of days. Those who were definitely hospitalized with COVID-19 infection, but also individuals who have persistent cardiac symptoms or reduced performance despite trying properly to retrain and go back into play. Those individuals will undergo comprehensive evaluation, and if normal, they can continue. If abnormal, then they may require further evaluation or treatment according to the relevant protocols. 
So this is the overall protocol suggested by the European section of sports cardiology and exercise. And I have to say that the Rugby Football Union with Richard Tingway and Simon Kemp have done an amazing job in uh, essentially simplifying that protocol for the doctors in a traffic light system with green, yellow and red where green you've got individuals with no history of mild disease with yellow you've got individuals who had prolonged illness or myocarditis, myocarditic uh, uh, sounding symptoms and they suggesting to their doctors that they should at least discuss those individuals with a cardiologist with an interest in sports cardiology and consider further evaluation and then for the red one who have the most severe or ongoing symptoms they suggest that they should be referred with to a sports cardiologist for further evaluation prior to return to training. And what uh, I've done on this particular slide, I tried to adapt that slide because we have to remember that it's not only elite athletes, it's uh, amateur athletes and regular exercises out there who may be trying to decide as to whether they can go back to exercise or there is an evaluation that needs to happen before they go back to exercise. And again, we've got the green, yellow and red. And essentially the message here is that if you haven't had any symptoms or only mild condition, then you don't need to have any cardiac evaluation and you can start gradually going back to retraining. While if you've got symptoms that cause concern, or had symptoms and with prolonged and severe illness or you were hospitalized, then you need to discuss it with a doctor with a lighter or stronger recommendation to be reviewed by a specialist. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, it goes without saying that one size does not fit all. The suggested protocols for cardiac evaluation prior to return to sport have to balance the risk versus the benefits and feasibility. It's important to highlight that only a small proportion of individuals, those who are more severely affected by the condition, may uh, uh, have uh, some cardiac involvement. And as such, our suggestion is that individuals who had no symptoms of mild disease can go back to gradual retraining without any cardiac evaluation, while individuals with persistent symptoms or reduced exercise performance those who were hospitalized due to the infection, those with prolonged or debilitating illness, and those with symptoms highly suggestive of myocarditis warrant further evaluation by a cardiologist. And if you're interested in sports cardiology and want to learn more, please uh, look at our Masters in Sports Cardiology at St. George's University of London, which will have the pleasure of being endorsed by a number of sporting and scientific organizations. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Michael. That's a, another fascinating talk. If I'd, I'd now like to just invite uh, Professor Sanjay Sharma just to, to, um, to give some concluding comments. Thank you very much again, Steve. Well, it's been uh, a really um, certainly interesting for me to listen to Matt and Michael today. But, you know, for me, the COVID-19 pandemic has really seen some very unprecedented times in sport with so many major events, such as the Olympics being cancelled over the past four to five months. Clearly, as elite sport returns and with data suggesting that there is a high prevalence of cardiac involvement, in hospitalized individuals, there is some concern about the risk to athletes. Uh, Matt has also pointed out that apart from the cardiac and respiratory risks, there are other uh, risks of um, injury uh, amongst individuals that have not been able to train properly. Uh, also, the other factors that may promote injury, such as a very heavy training program, which may also have um, adverse psychological effects in some of these sports people. But the one thing that is very clear is that there is uncertainty about how we're going to do things. Uh, you have learned from Michael Papadakis today that the protocols vary. Some people feel that all elite athletes should have cardiac investigations and quite extensive cardiac investigations, whereas our protocol is much, much more pragmatic and probably more realistic that suggests that in the vast majority of individuals, COVID-19 infection is going is likely to behave as flu 
And the vast majority of people with mild illness probably will not have any adverse events. And that's evidenced by the fact that we haven't had many deaths in people aged below 20 years. I'll state again, 0.1% uh, of deaths occurred in that age group. So I'd like to uh, hand over again to the moderator and allow the audience really to pose some questions. But before I do so, I would like to thank uh, two members of our team, our junior and new CRI research fellows, Raghav Bhatia and Sarandeep Marawaha, who were really instrumental in developing our protocol at St. George's Hospital. So thank you both for your help, and I'll hand over to the moderators. Wonderful. So uh, I, I think if we all stay uh, on our videos and then I will start shooting some questions that I've got and we've got plenty of questions from the audience here. So shall I start with Professor Sharam and ask you, uh, the audience asking, is there any gender predilection or is gender relevant to the severity of COVID-19 and to exercise recommendations or recommendations regarding screening for cardiac involvement? Prof? Okay. Well, the one thing that is that is uh, definitely uh, factual is that if we look at mortality uh, with COVID-19 infection, it's definitely higher in the male sex. There is uh, no doubt about that. Um, so I think gender may be relevant and whether this is because males may have a high concentration of ACE2 ACE receptors that allow the virus, that allows the virus to enter the cells, as far as screening for cardiac conditions, I think it would be discriminating to say that women should be treated, certainly female athletes should be treated differently to male athletes. And I would say that we should treat everyone the same. I think we should uh, maintain the pragmatic approach that the investigation, certainly the cardiac and respiratory investigation should be confined to those athletes that actually have the red flags that uh, have been alluded to by myself, uh, Michael and Matt. Thank you very much. And can I just ask Matt, uh, uh, Professor Sharma mentioned about the elevated heart rate and the audience is asking when athletes go back to retraining, what's actually an elevated heart rate? When should you get concern and what should you do about it? Matt, we can't hear you. I turned it off because that damn fire alarm, I'm sorry. Uh, well, first of all, if athletes have had a period of deconditioning, probably their heart rate response to normal exercise might be slightly exaggerated. And if it's warm outside, their heart rates will probably be slightly elevated on top of that. However, most will have an understanding about what their resting heart rates are when they wake up in the morning. So if their heart rate is 10 to 15 beats higher than what it normally is, and they are feeling under the weather, that's normally a pretty good indication that there might be something underlying that's ongoing. But the other avenue is that if athletes have returned to competition uh, and they are feeling chest discomfort, uh, palpitations, chest pain during exercise, that is also a red flag for us. Um, and invariably, they probably might not have pushed themselves that hard during lockdown training in isolation it is when they go back to competition they're amongst their peers they are pushing themselves harder than ever uh, uh, like they would do after a, a normal pre-season that these symptoms may come on i don't know if sanjay's got anything to add to that no i think i know i don't really um i'm i'm, I'm i actually agree with you Wonderful. So let me move to the next question and uh, relates uh, Professor Sharma to the mention of shortness of breath as a symptom for concern for cardiac involvement and myocarditis. Uh, and I would like both you of you and Matt Wilson's as well regarding as to what significant shortness of breath, how worried and when should we be worried. And also the audience is mentioning that they've seen athletes that they tend to become a bit out of breath towards the end of their illness and then gradually recover. When should you actually refer to a cardiologist? Well, I think the point really was not just the breathless. It was breathlessness that is disproportionate to the amount of exercise being performed. Now, most 
a custom athlete certainly know what their functional capacity is like and what their capabilities are. So if an athlete is going up a hill and is panting for breath uh, midway up the hill, and they wouldn't have normally done, if that happens once or twice, that is, that for me is breathless, that is breathlessness, that is disproportionate to the amount of exercise that's being performed. I should point out, of course, that there are multiple causes of breathlessness uh, in relation to the COVID pandemic, and it can't all be attributed to myocarditis. Uh, one has to worry about uh, uh, the respiratory involvement, also the fact that the virus may cause bronchospasm, resulting in asthma. Um, and so there are other things that need to be considered apart from myocarditis, but the key is breathlessness that is disproportionate to the amount of exercise being performed for that particular individual. Anything to add, Matt, regarding someone who going back into training? Well, asthma is particularly prevalent in endurance athletes. We know that. Uh, and so, you know, athletes who are, who are coming out of it, if they need a treatment review, they need to have their management optimised accordingly. It's the fundamentals that you would do with that anyway. But I know that James Hull at the Brompton uh, has um, at his recent RSN medicine meeting talked about respiratory involvement and the, the 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 downstream pathway that he would look to have for for respiratory issues. So um, I wouldn't be afraid to search that up. I would say that there is a there is a category that we missed out here um, to highlight, and that would be the Paralympic athletes. Um, and I know that the IOC are having a having a COVID. Paralympian special on the 17th of June. So for those people at home, perhaps type in IOC COVID Paralympian 17th of June and you'll see that come up. And that's one cohort that shouldn't be neglected, of course. Thank you very much. And can I just move to the next question? Uh, uh, and I'll ask both of you, actually. Uh, the question is how much or how intense does one have to exercise before getting some troponin rise? based obviously on what Professor Sarma mentioned about the challenges of identifying what's the underlying cause of troponin. Well, I believe there are several factors that determine whether you're going to get a troponin release or not. Um, one is um, your baseline exercising capacity, your level of fitness, your age. But there is this is a question of not one size fits all. Uh, let me give an example of a Premier League team, for example, where 36 odd, uh, 36 odd people had their troponins tested before they returned to training. Of that, most people did exercise the day before on their turbos. Uh, a third had a raised troponin above the 99th percentile. And there was no real rhyme or reason as to why one individual had a raised troponin versus not. But there is data out there that even... Uh, you know, s short distances such as running 5Ks, 10Ks, or even a long distance walk can result in troponin leak in some individuals. But uh, Matt's a sports scientist and he may have more on this uh, than I can give you at the moment. Not really. I, I suppose the, the, the thing to consider then is the time course of troponin back to baseline, shall we say. Um, and the difference between a physiological versus pathological troponin rise. Nothing to add more than Sanjay. Okay. And as you can imagine, a lot of people are asking about exercise testing in the era of uh, COVID-19. So what uh, has been your experience? I, I guess that's directed at me. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're, let's let's just, you know, we're talking to a very broad audience. There may be some elite athletes in this audience. There may be some weekend warriors in this audience. There may even be some healthcare professionals, including individuals that are gatekeepers for exercise stress tests from the NHS. So if we just put our doctor's hats on here, pure for the whole community, then there is, the, then exercise stress tests at the moment are considered uh, as, uh, aerosol generating procedures you know puffing and panting during an exercise stress test uh, would could potentially release a lot of virus in the atmosphere in an aerosolized form and in a hospital environment could infect staff uh, and other individuals and therefore most hospitals in the nhs uh, are not conducting exercise stress tests at the moment 
clearly elite athletes uh, and certainly individuals in whom there is suspicion of myocarditis uh, would be candidates for an exercise stress test. Uh, I suggest that these tests are performed uh, at centers uh, that, that have been designated. Uh, there are certainly some private centers are doing it. It's absolutely crucial that governance procedures are in place uh, really, truly to protect the health of the supervising consultant to wear adequate PPE, to make sure that there are procedures in the room that can actually um, get rid of uh, the aerosol quickly. And there is a cool off time in any room after an exercise stress test in a suspected individual is, is, is performed. But having said that, some of this may all be academic because uh, a lot of elite sports, certainly if there is a suspicion of COVID-19, uh, will almost certainly want nucleic acid tests and serology before placing an athlete on a treadmill. And the vast majority of athletes that I have supervised, I have known their COVID status before they get onto the treadmill. In your experience, Matt? No, identical. If, if we know what their status is, that helps in the, in the decision about whether the test goes ahead. But in terms of uh, SOPs for sterilization, they've got to be absolutely spot on, PPE procedures, the AC in the room, um, you know, minimizing exposure of individuals walking in and out of that room. So dotting and donning, it's, it's, it's got to be standardized and absolutely bang on, but it's, it's not an insurmountable challenge. So I think the bottom line is that it's happening. It's likely to happen more and more as we're getting used to the situation. Hopefully it will start happening as well within the national health system. Now, can I just bring in the conversation Steve as well? Uh, 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 and Steve, I've got a number of questions from uh, different sources, from cricket, from rugby, uh, from some cry volunteers, and they're asking when is it likely that the cry screening, since we're discussing about screening, may come back. And they also highlight the fact that although games, even for rugby, may not have started, still uh, retraining has started and they need uh, to be able to screen their athletes as they usually do. Yeah, so I think they're great questions. Uh, I mean, I don't have an exact answer right now. There are so many factors involved with us starting screening. On one hand, we've got private screenings like the work we do with rugby cricket, football. Now, those events are much easier to control. They'll have procedures in place to manage their athletes to, and, uh, and it will be their venue, their facilities will be working in their environments and invited in to conduct those tests. Those are quite in contrast to our public screening events where we're often using facilities of other venues um, who have their own risk assessments. We have to be clear that the public want to start engaging in screening. Are we going to be able to manage social distancing within the screening program? That's a major question. We're looking at that with the venues really later on in the year, to be honest, for our public screenings. I don't see us starting that in the next couple of months. Um, we also have to have the right PPE for all our staff conducting the screening. And then there are questions about whether we can continue with our current model, which is where we do the ECG. Then there is a wait for the individual. About 4% of individuals need to have a follow-up ultrasound. Everyone would see the, the doctor there on the day and have a consultation with the doctor. So we're also looking at whether that is the correct structure in the current climate, because quite possibly it might be a time to revert to an ECG only screening where it's going to be much easier to manage any risks associated um, with COVID as opposed to the more in-depth consultations. I, I think that a major factor is whether we can go into those venues, though, for our public screenings, because hospitals um, where we conduct screenings, GP surgeries, um, all of these environments are having to look at different structures for bringing their patients back in, in a safe way, and um, they may not be wanting the additional numbers of people coming in who are typically come in from a cry screening. So I think there are there are many factors. We're reviewing this all the time. Um, I think that it's a challenge um, without any question. I've seen on the uh, one of the questions about rugby screenings, will they be starting? I, I don't really see any reason why 
they can't because there are it is possible for many more controls around the individuals coming into the screening as opposed to our public environment screenings which actually is is more than 90 percent of the screening we do is for general population yes and i think we'll probably have to review that particularly for the elite sports because a lot of the time uh, uh, the, uh, signing a player as well or something along those lines may be uh, closely related to whether those that player has been screened even from a cardiac perspective Thank you very much. So I'll just find a couple more questions before we finish. So Professor Sharma, the, uh, uh, the audience is asking uh, about influenza and COVID-19. So they're asking what's the likelihood of myocarditis in COVID-19 compared to the influenza virus and whether all the precautions that we're taking for COVID-19 should be actually be applicable to other transmissible viral infections that may affect athletes. Prof. Sharma? Muted, Sandra. You're muted. Still. Still. Any views on influenza versus COVID-19, Matt? Oh, well, it's, it's a very good and personal question. And from personal experience of having myocarditis, it is bad. Um, so I, I, think, I think the factor for me uh, working with athletes is, is not to forget the basics uh, and to be uh, rightly concerned when your athletes are showing flu viral related symptoms. Um, and you should not be training with a flu uh, with a flu-like symptom, uh, and you should be isolating from your team teammates, just as you would do if it was COVID. The fact that it is COVID and it has heightened our awareness doesn't mean doesn't negate the, the, the basics that physicians have always been concerned about flu and have always been concerned about myocarditis in this cohort that push themselves and push their heart rates at a very very high level on a repeated basis. Tell an athlete to tell an athlete not to train whilst they're sick. They'll invariably ignore you. So it's very, very crucial. <laughs> and people are also asking about the the proposed protocols. How useful is sick? Uh, clinical evaluation in terms of history and physical examination and obviously that's in the wider context of evaluating an athlete and try to elicit symptoms that may cause concern uh, in the overall assessment of the athletes including the cardiac symptoms as well but you're absolutely right that uh, as far as the actual examination is concerned the positive finding that may be useful they are fairly limited obviously you can have things like uh, uh, tachycardia, you can have, uh, uh, you can see signs of uh, breathlessness along those lines, but those are very general and unlikely to be particularly uh, helpful on a particular athlete. May I, may I say something? Yes, of course. Now that you can hear me, um, this thing about COVID-19 and the flu, the, 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 the parallels, uh, there are some parallels. What we've got to remember, of course, is that flu, um, during the flu time, we didn't have the high sensitive troponins, you know, as high sensitive as we are now. And probably people, not every single person going into hospital with an illness was having their troponin checked. We've got to remember that the troponin story that we are dealing with is from the sickest people that have had this infection. We're dealing with the sickest people with the greatest comorbidities, the oldest individuals that have had this illness. I cannot see how we can extrapolate this troponin data to young, fit, not even young, even middle-aged, fit, healthy individuals who don't have any of these illnesses. I think, if we, I think all we can say is that we speculate that COVID-19 may have a higher prevalence of uh, you know, cardiac damage than flu. That's about all we can say. But one thing that we can do uh, it, it, amongst those who are going to continue to measure troponins is to use this as a research tool to find out what would happen if you did measure troponins, interleukin-6, BNPs in every single athlete. You know, what sort of can of worms would you open up? 
and what would your diagnostic yield be and how it would positively or negatively influence the care of the athlete, the asymptomatic athlete. Thank you very much. And uh, as we said before during the presentation, obviously we've got no data on uh, the less uh, severely affected individuals, particularly young athletes. So there is a potential research project there in order to address that question and also try and in a way validate the protocols that we're proposing. So I think I'll have to leave it at that because we're not getting up to 1 hour and 15 minutes. And I'll turn the microphone back to our host, uh, Dr. Steve Cox. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. Really appreciate uh, brilliant talk from everyone. I think uh, I can see there are a lot more questions that we didn't have time to time to answer, and hopefully we can maybe revisit those at a later date. Um, as a final note, I'd just like to say this is our our first webinar we've ever done at Cry. Um, Thankfully, it seems like the technology has gone all right. We've still got sort of over almost three quarters of the audience are still with us, even though we've gone over time a little bit. Um, so thank you very much, everyone, for staying with us. Um, if you're interested in our conference and our future webinars or our research, please do go to this page where you can register and then receive any updated information on future events. Um, we'd also very much like to have your feedback to see how today's gone, um, topics for future webinars, um, when you would like them to be timed, whether it's during work hours, after hours, um, also how long you would like them to be. So any feedback, any information would be very welcome, very much uh, appreciated. Um, so I'd just like to, on that note, say thank you very much for joining us. Um, and see you later.